Hey, welcome to Navigation Church Online. This, we are doing church where you are. Why is that? Because, well, the church isn't a building. The church is you. So we're so glad that you tuned in and watched us. Uh, one of the things I need to know now, because last week something amazing happened, I asked the question, where are you watching from? A lot of you responded. Uh, found out that we actually had people tuning in as far as Maryland. Not Maryland Heights over Missouri, but the actual, the other Maryland. And so my question, again, where are you watching from today? Uh, do you have your family with you? You by yourself? Just jump online. Our pastoral staff and the team here, we're ready to interact with you online today. And throughout the service, make sure to be leaving comments. Just so you know, if you amen on social media, I hear you now. So I don't know how that works, but uh, make sure to be leaving us a message where you're at, where you're watching from. We're going to be in our Miracles of Mercy book, page 104. If you're tuning in right now and you say, well, I didn't buy a book. I don't have a book. That's fine. Download our app. Go to either of your app stores and look up Navigation Church. You can download our apps. And in that app, you'll find today's sermon notes that you'll be able to follow through with us. As well as if you are maybe, can I say it this way, a first time guest, you're just now getting to know Navigation Church. You're scrolling through and you stop just long enough to see what's going on here. If you are on Facebook, go to the tab right now where it says about, about us. And then in the bottom, you'll see something titled, you are welcomed. There's a little card that you can fill out there just to let us know that you are here. And here's the coolest thing about it. If you fill that out, we will make a $5 donation in your name to our charity of the month. Here's how we do it at Navigation Church. Anybody who's a first-time guest, if you fill out a card, we pick a charity of the month. At the end of the month, we write them one good-sized check, and your name would be a part of making that donation. And so it, this is exclusive on our Facebook feed right now. Go to About, you, uh, where you're welcomed at. You'll see a little photo down there. We'd love for you to fill that out. Now, having said that, we're into the sermon part. And yes, we've been talking about the miracles of mercy. Um, before I jump into that, I just want to talk to you for a minute, if that's all right. Because we as a team have been uh, wondering, do we need to continue this miracle of mercies? The reason you're watching us now and you're not sitting here with us, with me, I actually, I can say us because the band st uh, stayed around to help me. They're my, what I say, my live studio on it. So let me hear from you. Okay. So I'm not just talking to a camera right now. The, the band st uh, is here with me. Um, but one of the things that we've been talking about is, do we, should we continue this? The reason you're watching it where you are is because of something, the coronavirus. We all know about this. Uh, we are being socially responsible, which I know you are too, watching from your host, uh, to keep distance from other people, not wanting to spread it, the virus. And so we talked about, should we like stop the miracle of mercy conversation uh, because all of this was going to be leading up to Easter and are we even going to be able to have service live during Easter time? Well, just an, a quick FYI on that, myself and my team, we met through a Zoom call yesterday uh, to actually discuss these very things and tomorrow we'll be rolling out information just what the next couple weeks look like here at Navigation Church. But I want to stay focused on the here and now because it kind of was this question of should we pivot and be talking about social awareness? Do we need to be talking about the coronavirus? Uh, what is your responsibility? What is mine? What do we do as a church in the season? And it kind of just came down to this for us is God knew six months ago that we were going to be doing a 40-day campaign. God knew that what would be four or five months ago when we landed on this is the one that we feel like we should do, that we'd be in the middle of this campaign and God's aware that this week we're going to be talking about how to deal with your enemies. And so I'm not sure it'd be healthy just to immediately pivot to jump on the conversation happening in the world around so that you have one more person's opinion about it. Can I, can I say it that way? There's plenty of thoughts. And here's saying, I'm not a doctor. I'm not a scientist. I'm, I could only regurgitate what so many other people are saying. But here's the one thing I do know. A, you're in closed quarter environments with a lot of people right now. It'd be easy for them to become your enemies. <laughs> it would be easy, can I say, it'd be easy for God to use Holy Spirit sandpaper on you known as relationships. So, so what are you going to do with those? You know, and so, but then the other thing is, 
I've been finding that I have a lot of time alone to think right now. Now, I know that's going to be hard for everyone to believe because I have six kids, or six kids. I have, I have four kids, and I'm only going to tell you about them, but, and then my wife and myself. So there's, a, so there's always noise happening, but despite having a larger family, um, there's a lot of time for conversation. And, and here's what happens in our brain, and see if, see if you believe this or if you know this to be true, that if you're by yourself sometimes, old conversations reappear so that you can continue to win the fight. And so I'm just wondering, during this time of separation, you know, we're, we're separated geographically, but I'm wondering if the Holy Spirit wants to say, do something relationally very near. And so if God's wanting to do some of those things, now's the best time for you to write a note to someone that maybe you've had a relational rut with. Maybe, maybe now's the perfect time to send a text, to do a FaceTime, to, to get in, in relationship with someone that you've been distanced from. Because when it comes to the miracle of mercies, there are those that God's going to call you to that you may not be in the best relationship with. So, so I think we're in a very good spot to stay here and to do this and have this conversation. So if you've been journeying with us, I'm going to say this. Today we're going to talk about how to mercy your enemy. But if you haven't been with us in this conversation for a couple of weeks, here's the title to your sermon. How to get out of relational ruts. And I think both titles are going to work just fine. But either one, if, you, if you've been a part of this, you'll see how this conversation grows. If this is the one time that you've connected with Navigation Church, you're still going to be able to find this. Because most of the times when it comes to relational ruts, or if I can say that this way, trying to mercy the enemy, the number one person that makes that uh, not happen is the person you're looking at in the mirror. It's you. We get in our own way from being able to mercy someone else. We get in our own way from being able to reach out this way. And so here's what I'd say. Today we're going to talk about being a peacemaker, not a peacekeeper. See, a peacekeeper is someone who's going to step into a situation and do everything they can to make every party to stay in their corner. But sometimes, and parents, it's, it, by, right now is going to be a time that you can type amen to this. Sometimes, as a parent, in order for me to be a peacemaker, I actually go into a little bit of a war time, especially with the kids, right? Because you're going you're gonna to settle them down, and you're going to move them to your own corner. I'm going to make peace. I'm going to intentionally step in, and whatever the skirmish is happening, I'm going to step in and make peace. I'm not going to say, you know, Judah, you go to your corner. Giddy, you go to your corner. Silas, go to your corner. By the way, his name's Gideon, not Giddy. And I just heard it after I said it. If you just walk up and call him Giddy, it'll be awkward. So it's Gideon. I don't know why I'm going in this much detail. Let's keep moving forward. Like if I let everyone go to their corner still shouting at each other, it may seem peaceful, but I didn't make peace. Today, we're going to talk about how to actually make peace in our life because we're actually blessed are the peacemakers. This is a scripture out of Matthew that we see because we are called to be peacemakers on the earth. And so here's what I'm going to do. We're going to talk about the seven steps of reconciliation. Page 104 in your book or you can download our app. And here's the very first point that I want to make to you. When it comes to reconciliation, when it comes to mercying your enemy, when it comes to getting out of relational ruts, step number one is this, you have to make the first move. So many times, you know this to be true, I know this to be true, there's relationships that we're in, friendships that we want, something happens, a, a conflict happens between the two of us, we move away, you walk away, there's separation that occurs, and we continue to fight the battle in our mind, but something deep inside of us want to actually reach out to them because we value that friendship, we love that friendship, we want that friendship, but we allow something else to get in the way of that, and that's us, pride us being right, us winning, whatever that might be. And there's times in our life that we need to be able to take the, the first step to say, I value this friendship. I value this relationship. And we have to get us out of the way to make that happen. And by the way, the Bible is very, very serious about you doing this. And I'm going to say a scripture right now that if you're not a follower of Christ and you're not a big time Christian, this is going to blow your mind because you probably believe that the church is all about money, money, money. We need money, money, money. And Jesus is about to blow your mind, mind, mind. You ready for this? 
It says, if you're about to place your gift on the altar, this is out of Matthew 5, 23 through 24. If you're about to come and place a gift or your worship or your money on the altar, here's what it says. And you remember someone who is angry with you. Leave your gift in front of the altar Go make peace with that gift or with that person. Then come back and give your gift to God. God is not interested in your money. God is not interested in your worship. God is not interested in your sacrifice. If you have a broken relationship with someone, God's actually more interested in us mending a relationship with someone than he is for us to come and worship him. I mean, that is a mind-blowing thought, right? Because we got to be here on a Sunday morning and you got to give and you got to sacrifice and you got to do all those things. And God is saying, listen, this entire thing, everything in this world, everything in our life is actually built on this relationships. And how can we have a right relationship with him if I have a wrong relationship with you? It's broken. It's, it's, it, it all works together. I, right now I have the Lion King coming up inside of me and I feel like I should sing Circle of Life, but I won't because I'll get blocked on one of our servers. So like, it, you got to just imagine in your own brain. Here, here's what I, one way to say it. It's more important to be reconciled than religious. And I absolutely love that thought. And you go, well, what is the model that I can live off of? Romans 5, 8 through 10 says this, while we were still sinners... While we were still, Christ died for us. While we were his enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son. God was willing to make the first step our direction, despite the fact that we had a complete broken relationship with him, because relationship was most, the most important thing in his mind at that time. So when it comes to reconciling and you have to make the first move, and this is on page 105, this is a fill-in right here, the only way to resolve a conflict is to face it. Have you ever heard the phrase, time heals all wounds? I believe a very immature, emotional person made that phrase. Um, I'm not sure where it came from. I'm not sure the origin of it. But I believe someone with deep wounds is someone that would say that. Because I would probably say it this way. Time makes all wounds infected. Time makes all wounds worse. Time makes all wounds into scars. And so if you have a wound with someone in a relationship, you know, uh, let me just kind of pause here. and I, I have been, here, here's what you're supposed to do as a pastor right now, you're supposed to tell like a personal story of a time and a place that you had a wound and you were willing to face it or you made the first step towards someone. And if I just be honest with you, I'm sure there's a story in my life for positive. But as I've been thinking about these, the only stories I can remember are the, people's that, the people that I didn't take the first step in. And I can remember... Uh, not even high school, all the way through grade school, high school, an incredibly close friend of mine, went on vacation together. I have no idea where he's at now. I wonder about him all the time. I remember I went to a year of schooling out on the West Coast, someone who helped me get through it. Uh, at the end, we took communion together at this restaurant. Is, uh, the restaurant wasn't even open, but they let us come in. We got some juice and got some bread. We had one of the most amazing times of communion ever. One little thing happened, and he was the most incredible man that I've been able to meet. One little thing happened, and I never made the first move back to him. And I, I, I'm supposed to like tell you this personal story to encourage you, and this is how you do it. But honestly, as I read this, the only stories that keep coming to my mind are the ones of regret that I didn't take time to do it. And probably because I didn't face me. You know, I didn't look into who, I'm, who, I'm, who I am and what part I played. So I'm just going to pause here and just ask you the question, what relationship in your life right now do you need to make the first move? Because just by answering that, here's what I know. I know the Holy Spirit is working in your living room, on your phone, on your TV, on your laptop, wherever you're at. And if you had one come to mind, I, just, I need an amen out of you. Just type it, say something. Don't put a name. Don't reference anybody. 
you know, hit the like button, share this, whatever you're supposed to do, and I'm supposed to be promoting to make our hits higher. I could care less right now. I want you to get into the relationship that you need to. And then when you get there, here's what you need to ask God. When you know who that person is, you need to ask God for wisdom. I love these two scriptures. Going to read them back to back. If you want to know God, if you want to know what God wants you to do, ask Him. He will gladly tell you. And that's just mind blowing. I mean, that should that shouldn't even be a scripture. That should just be, hey God, what do you want? And He's going to tell you. James one five. And the right words at the right time is like precious gold set in silver. Proverbs twenty five eleven. You know, when it comes to asking God for wisdom. Um, there's a couple things that we need to know. One, yes, when we ask, he's going to give it to us. But also, number two, there's a lot of times that I ask God a question and I expect him to give me the answer that I already have prescribed for him. If you ask God a question, you may not like his response. This is a fact. Because most of the time, which we're going to see here in just a second, sometimes God's not interested in just working on the other person. This is mind blowing. Ready for this? He wants to work on you. And he wants to work on me because no matter how many times I tell my wife this, I'm not perfect. Wait, oh, no, no. I tell her that I am perfect, but I'm not perfect. And I'm not a perfect father. I'm not a perfect husband. I'm not a perfect pastor. I'm not a perfect friend. I'm not a perfect anything. And if there's a relational rut, there always takes two to tangle, right? There takes two to be in this conversation. And so when we're do doing this and you're asking God for wisdom, one of the things that I always ask God for is give me an open door to this conversation. Because if there's not an open door to the conversation and you force it, most likely all you have is a closed relationship from there on out. Because I can tell you now, and by the way, anybody in here, you know it's yes, and this is true. How many times have you forced a conversation onto someone and you didn't go in serving to restore a relationship, you went in to dump your issue on them and you wanted to make sure they knew your point, you were right, your side of the story. Or, or here's what we do, here's the other thing, great thing we do. We actually cloak it in this like religious garb, this spiritual garb, this personal concern garb, take even Christianity out of this, and we go to them and we're gonna give them advice for how they can be better. And, and ready for this, here's your phrase of the day, advice not sought is rarely taken. So if, you, if, if there is not an open door for you to go to them and share this with them and give this to them, you can have something as precious as gold set in silver. If they're not asking for it, you're not giving it to them. And chance are you didn't actually ask God, how do I do what's on my heart to do? And when you ask God to do this, most likely, here's what's going to happen. He's going to have you start with your own confession. That's point number three on page 105. Start with your own confession. Or can I say it this way? Ask this prayer. God, what part of this did I play? So I'm about to give you some secret sauce to counseling. You ready for this? Anytime that I do marriage counseling, most of the time, most of the time, it starts with one of the two people coming in to see me. Because they're fed up, they're tired, they're throwing in the towel. They're seeking help, and, but instead of the marriage counseling, which by the way, you can only do marriage counseling if there's two people there. So they come in and they start letting me know everything that's wrong with the other person. So ready for this? I'm about to, if you ever come to me for marriage counseling, I'm about to show you my secret sauce. Here it is. I will actually take and I will draw a circle whoop, on a piece of paper. And I say, we've been talking about her, 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 him, him, him this whole time. Take this pen and do me a favor. In this relationship, can you draw a diagram of how much of this relational rut you're responsible for, right? And most of the time, they try to be generous, right? They're like, well, I'll give 25%, right? Like this here, all me, all me. But when they, 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 and they, they, they go back and they start focusing on that part of the pie, the big part of the pie. And somewhere along the line, when they take a deep breath because they're finally exhausted of telling me why the other person's uh, um, all wrong, I will say this. Can, we, can you do me a favor? Can we just talk about this part of the pie right now? 
Because until we start the conversation with I statements, until we start the conversation of what part do you play, we will never get anywhere further because the Bible tells us this, that when it comes to relational ruts, when it comes to having enemies, when it comes to having, being able to mercy someone but you can't even start liking them, it's happening for two reasons and it's pride and self-centeredness. And it's not only pride and self-centeredness on their part. We always play a part because guess what? If you didn't have pride in that situation, if you weren't self-centered in that situation, chances are there wouldn't be a fight because there wouldn't be a rub. Now, it could be as simple as you just going, I don't care. Like, you know, like you're getting all up in arms. I have no dog in this fight, cat in this fight, dog, dog in this fight. I knew it was one of those animals I don't own. So, like, I don't, you know, I don't have a goldfish in this fight. You know, they can have the food. Like, but when it comes to an argument, it's probably self-centered. And you're like, Pastor, you're just making stuff up. Really, Proverbs 13, 10 says this. Pride only leads to argument. I love the, the earlier Proverbs that we read that you're like, oh, man, that's really deep. We don't want to read this one because, well, it's really focused on us now. And then ready for this, James 4, 1 says, what causes fights and quarrels among you? I think this is what we're talking about. We don't have to read into it. He's actually telling us right here. Aren't they caused by selfish desires that fight to control you? Pride and self-centeredness are the things that will do it. And the next scripture in your book there, Matthew, it says, you know, there's so often that we are focused in the speck in someone else's eye and we miss the log in ours. Hey, you guys, right? I need you to do this at home. I know this is going to be weird. Everyone, give me, you know, put up a finger. Everyone out here, I, I can see you if you're not doing it. Wake up. No, I'm just kidding. No one's asleep. So, so take your finger. Way out there, as far as your arm can stretch, tiny little finger, right? Right? Tiny. Those of you with glasses, go down. Your bifocals will kick in. So, okay. So, right, it's a, it's a tiny little finger. I'm talking to you online. I need your finger out. I don't know. I, I, okay, there. Everyone's doing it now. Now, do me a favor slowly move this towards your, your eyeball. And what's happening? It's getting bigger, right? Tell me when it's right outside your eyeball, that doesn't look the size of a log. This is the point that this scripture is trying to make. You can take your hand now. You just look weird. Just put your hand up. So this is the point. Imagine this finger being across the other side of the room in front of that guy's eye. You would say this, man, that's as small as a speck. But when you take the issue and you actually approach it to your own vantage point, that's when it starts looking like a log. We always see the worst in someone else when it's the biggest problem inside of us. And we'd rather deal with your speck than my log. And so we have to be able to face what happens when, when it comes to us. So we start with our own confession, and then when we start with our own confession, or can we say this, imagine yourself in a conversation now with someone, and we're going to start with our own confession. So I feel like I had, when I heard this, and we're using these I statements to try to own the part that we can own, here's the thing. There comes a time when we need to listen to their pain and their perspective. That's on page 106, the fourth point, listen to their pain and perspective. Or if you were part of last week's conversation, I would say this, point, it, it, when it comes to people, are we willing to look behind the pain? Are we willing to get a perspective on their pain? Because there's so many times where we enter into the conversation and we have to ask this question, are we speaking to be heard or are we speaking to be understood? Are we speaking to understand or are we speaking to be just heard? I mean, it, there's so often, and you know this, gosh, I, I know I'm going to point this out and you're all going to know it to be true. How many times in a conversation you say something and after you say it and they go to respond, the only thing happening in your head is the response you're about to give to their argument. You're not even listening to see if it's going to change your perspective. I actually had a conversation with an individual. I got to leave this really vague. I shouldn't do this. Like, it, it, like I've, I think I've grown as an individual, but sometimes I wonder. So, so it, it was actually a part being a part of a volunteer thing. And, and they literally said to me, like, I have no idea why we even do this. And I said, well, that's a great question. And, and by the way, this was a time when they're like ready to leave the church. 
And, and after they told me, and I don't even stand why they do this, I said, well, do you know the reason we put that in place was a while back we had this, this, and this happen here. And he goes, no, I didn't even know about that. I said, the reason you didn't know about it was it didn't affect everybody, but we knew how to fix it. We knew how to overcome it. And since we put this into place, we've never had that issue again. And it was a safety issue. It was a health issue for, you know, for, for the facility. And he goes, man, I never knew that. He goes, well, regardless. Hang on, I just gave you brand new information that could change the trajectory of what you're planning on doing in your life. But the thing, he wasn't speaking to be understood or to understand he was speaking to be understood. And so, so often we shortcome that thing. And so here's the thing we have to do. We have to be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. This is such a good scripture. Let's make this the scripture of the week. You ready for this? So if, if you're on page 106, we, right now, don't worry, it's gonna pop up on your screen. You'll be able to say it. At home, you do have to say this out loud. And yes, last week, all my kids and my wife said it out loud. So it's awkward at first, but we, had, we got you clapping during worship. So I know you'll be able to do it. Ready for this? I'm gonna read it once, and then we're gonna say it two times back to back together. Be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow slow to become angry, James 1, 19. Now say it with me. Be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry, James 1, 19. Say it again. Be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry, James 1, 19. You know what? Here's, I'm going to have you do something else. Take your pen right now, and I'm going to have you add a little thing right up here. So be quick to listen, comma, slow to speak, and then right above the next word slow, write this, the byproduct is. Or here's how maybe we could read. Be quick to listen, slow to speak, and the byproduct is me not becoming angry. Doesn't that make sense? Because we're slowing everything down. So we're going to be quick to listen. We're going to listen to them with intent. And then we're going to be slow to speak. Why? Because when, we've, when we're about to speak, we've been processing the information that you gave me and the information that you gave me may change the way that I'm speaking in this, in, in this situation. And I'm going to speak different in this situation because I care about the relationship, not about being right. And so this is one of these great scriptures. And by the way, you should be able to do this in Philippians 2, 4, 1 through 5 says this. Each of you should look not only into your own interest. Boy, you would think this, this was something written for our society today, right? This was written thousands of years ago. But you also, to the interest of others, your attitude should be the same as Christ Jesus. And the word look there, you should look not only. It, it's the actually he, Hebrew word or Greek word, excuse me, scorpius which we get microscope or telescope. So how often in our life when we're dealing with the situation do we focus like a microscope all about us? Do we focus like a telescope looking into the distance? What is this going to cause me? The pain that I'm going to have to deal with. We become so myoptically focused on these type of things. We lose focus on focusing on other people. But the attitude of Jesus Christ, his entire life here on earth was nothing about him. It was actually all about providing for us. And so God's saying that we need to listen to their pain and perspective to be able to respond. But then what we need to do is we need to speak the truth tactfully. I looked up something very interesting. You know, when it comes to our communication, 7% of it is heard by our words, 55% by our body language, 38% by our tone. Only 7% by the actual words that are coming out of my mouth. And so parents, right now, this is a great time for you to say, yes, amen, I have a teenager, whatever it is. How often do you know that when you hear them go, yeah, I got it done, what, what did you hear in that sentence? Uh, okay, husbands, ready for this? Yeah, babe, I love you. I forgive you. It's over. <laughs> okay, so you don't have to laugh like that. Like, we, we know that the tone matters. Here's what I discovered the other day. I have a four-year-old daughter. She was in our bed. Why? Because why not come in every night? No, I'm just kidding. She's sleeping in her bed now. It's fantastic. But she was in our bed the other morning, and I said something about needing to go downstairs because right now the boys are at home doing homework, and we need to go down and do, um, do breakfast. And she goes, fine. My four-year-old daughter rolled her eyes at me. 
I didn't hear the word fine. You know what I saw? 55% of body language and 38% of the tone. She eye rolled me at four years old. Is there a manual I don't know about? Is there a special pamphlet that women get, that kids get, that teenagers get, that as parents I never got? And somehow you decide the best way to communicate is by being put out, slumping your shoulders, rolling your eyes. And let's be honest, I can't be that honest. So... <laughs> Like, it's just absolutely amazing. So if I were to say to someone, fine, you're right. Hmm. Okay, it's all my fault. It's all my fault. I didn't just own that. Here's what I said. I'm done arguing with me, so I'm going to take ownership of it so we can move past this because you're an idiot. Like, I'm not calling you that. I'm just using that example. That's what's actually happening. So we need to speak truth. Well, can we say it like this? Ephesians 4, uh, 15. Speak the truth in love. Watch our tone. Watch our posture. You know, I, here's the way I would say it. I have to do a character break or a character check. And I check myself and then be able to re-engage in that conversation. And by the way, these are, um, I I love the book. I love what we've been able to do here. But if I was never going to start a bumper sticker company, here's some of the things I would put on it. Ready? The truth is not. uh, The truth is not enough. It's not just what you say. It's how you say it. Here's another one for you. If you speak offensively, it will not be, it will be received defensively. Ready? You are never persuasive when you're abrasive. See, and you see all these on bumper stickers, right? Ready? You'll never get your point across if you're being cross. So here are three areas that the Bible tells us that you'll never work when I can say this. If you want to increase conflict, do this. Number one, no longer say insulting or cruel things about each other. Colossians 3.8. How many know if you want your conflict to increase... The best thing for you to do is continue to insult the other person. Here's what's happening. You need to know this. Every time you assault them, your goal is to actually demoralize them. Because somehow in our just messed up brain, if I demoralize you or bring you down enough, somehow that elevates me. But the reality, the only reason I'm trying to bring them down is because I already feel below. So we're grabbing at their heels to try to tear them down when it comes to insulting and cruel things. Do not use harmful words, but only helpful words. Be kind and build up and provide what is needed so that, you will, so that what you will say will do good to those who hear it. Ephesians 4, 29. You know when that thought comes in your head, you're planning on saying this, not making things better. Don't say it. Go back to last week. It's better for you to control your tongue than to conquer a city. But I can't tell you how many times, I don't know if it's because the kids just practicing on each other. I need parents out there that know more than I do on this one. But it's just amazing how often they just say cruel things, insulting things to one another, and not the helpful. Why is it natural for human nature to tear down one another? I would guess that's the sin nature in us. So we have to fight against this. Reckless words pierce like swords, but a tongue of the wise brings healing. Harsh words hurt, loving words heal. You know, I have found something to be true in my life, and by the way, I'm not the first one to say this, nor will I be the last. We actually use the thing that's hurt us the worst because to try to hurt others the most. See, some people, they'll say, you're stupid. And it doesn't affect someone else, but it affects them deeply because somewhere along the line, someone called them stupid. Somewhere along, dude, you're just ugly. Wait, what? Why would you say ugly? Somewhere there's a belief system, that's who you are. And I can tell you, without a doubt, I know what mine is. If I just say, you're useless. Somewhere along the line, I believed I was. And my wife always knows this, and unfortunately, it's so painful to think this, but I've used it on her. I've used it on the kids. And I just get to the point where rather than trying to build up and love, I just want to wound and feel better. And if I ever just say, and I mean this, if I ever just say, man, you're just useless to me. You should just know that I'm at the bottom of who I am as a person. I'm losing every fight, and the sin nature in me is up through the roof right now. Because somewhere along the line, I just believe that about myself. 
And if it hurt me this deep, I'm only hoping that it'll hurt you that bad. The Bible does not want us to tear each other down. It wants us to build them up. And so how do we do that? Point number six, bottom of 106, fix the problem, not, or uh, uh, fix the problem, not the blame. The blame game is a waste of time. As long as you're fixing on the blame, you'll never, fix the, you'll never be fixing the problem. As long as you're attacking each other, you're not attacking the issues. Think back to your last big fight with an individual that you love a lot. And if you replay it in your head, how often in that fight are you focused on assessing the blame to someone? Right? You're focused on assigning fault to an individual about the situation at hand, and you're so focused on the blame, you're never focusing on the relationship. Well, Pastor, that's really easy to say. How do you, how do you assume, how do you tell us, instead of focusing on the problem, focus on the relationship, how could we do this? I would say this, one of you needs to make the first move. After that, you need to ask God for wisdom. I dare you. I just, I double dog dare you right now in the next of the big fight. Say, can we pause real quick? And you bow your head and you legitimately say, God, help me in this situation. God, could you show me where I'm wrong in this situation? And the moment you're done saying, you go, honey, or this is how I would start it because I have a honey on the other side. Honey, I need to tell you this. In this situation, I believe this and I'm thinking this and I'm feeling this and I'm gonna start recognizing what part of it is wrong with me. And after I get done with that, I'm gonna close my mouth because I don't wanna be heard. I need to be hearing what you're trying to say and I'm going to, what? Listen to your pain and your perspective. And after I pause and listen to your pain and spectacle, we're gonna speak with truth in love to each other because here's the crazy thing. We cannot be about being right. We have to be about the relationship. And by the way, if I win a fight in my marriage, that means she loses. Why would I possibly wanna do that? Why would, if you're a friend of mine, if you're in a relationship, if we're brothers, if we're sisters, why in, the possibility, why in the world would I want to win a fight? Because that means you lose? You're a loser? Like what, what term do we put to that there? I'm going to speak tragically in truth. And then by this point, you're no longer focused on the problem, you're on the blame, you're focused on the solution. And, and by the way, I'm going to do a quick pause here. I need to hear from you on Facebook. This is going to, or any, any of our social media platforms, this is going to get me in trouble. But I, I, f I think it's Holy Spirit inspired right now, but I could be absolutely dead wrong. I, I keep finding myself using my wife as an example in these, but here's saying it's my biggest relationship that I have. And in October, I know that seems really far away right now, but later on this year, we've, we've set aside three weeks for a relationship conversation. And I think it would be awesome to have my wife on stage with me for those w three weeks. But I have no idea if you would care about it. And I'm, I just, I'm not even looking at my live studio audience right now because it's shaking my head. If you would love to hear from my wife, by the way, majority poll doesn't matter. If my wife doesn't want to be up here, I love her enough that I'm not going to make her. But I think you would love to hear from her. And here's what thought is. We do two weeks where we share relationship thoughts with you. But then the third week is complete Q&A. We only answer questions that are sent in to us. So if you would like to know that, if you would like to see that, could you do me a favor, jump on social media. And by the way, this is not a majority wins, like we're gonna force her to do it. I would just love to know if you would like to hear that. And, and I should probably edit this part out, but we can't, we're streaming live. So here it is. And the final thing is, and, and we may need to do this in my relationship. We need to focus on reconciliation, not resolution. We need to focus on restoring the relationship not on solving all the problems. Because are you ready for this? There's a chance you're going to have a lot of friends that you don't agree 100% with. And can you guys do me a favor? I'm going to say that again. As soon as I do it, can you go, ooh, right? And you can even type ooh right now, ready? There's a chance you're going to be in relationships with a whole lot of people and a whole lot of them you won't be in 100% agreement with. I know, I know. So here's the thing. Can you have reconciliation without full resolution? Or can you get to this point? Are you okay not being okay with everything that I believe? And by the way, if you answer no to that, don't get married. But there, it's it's mind-blowing to me, and I'm not going to tell you who's who, but... Oh, no, not even going to do it. Not even going to do that example. You know why? I, I'm pretty sure I just took my, uh, took my foot 
and I shoved it in your mouth a couple minutes ago, and I'm not going to give you a dishwasher example. I'm just not going to do it. And I do it wrong, and I'm going to admit, I'll do it wrong. I don't. Okay, so here we go. But there are things, actually, philosophically speaking, I've been in a long-time relationship, and there's just things we see things different. But we're more interested in the relationship and that reconciliation than one of us being right. So what can you do to focus on the reconciliation? But Because you can uh, disagree without being disagreeable, right? You can be able to do that. So I've already said it once, and I'm just going to say it again. When it comes to resolving conflict, when it comes to getting out of relational ruts, when it comes to needing to mercy your enemy, what's more important, being right or being in the relationship? Because I believe Jesus, I believe he was actually more interested in the relationship than being right. Oddly enough, though, he was completely right. But yet he was so confident in his rightness that he was willing to sacrifice for the relationship. So if you don't know what I'm talking about, here's what I'm talking about. Jesus Christ, who was sinless, never had a flaw, who still had relational difficulties with people that betrayed him, lied about him, persecuted him. Even up to his dying breath, he was saying, forgive them, they don't know what they're doing. Because God was so interested in in a relationship with humanity, with mankind, that he actually gave his life in order to get into a relationship with us. And by the way, I know there's some of you that have stayed watching. Maybe kind of like you thought these are good points and you can better your life, but now you're faced with this question. Are you ready to be in a relationship with Jesus Christ? All those churches that you passed all the time, the evangelists that you made fun on TV, the goofy things that someone shared to you on a social media clip, and you go, oh man, those Christians. Somewhere right now with me talking, you're feeling the pull to become one of them. It's because what we've been doing here feels a lot different to you. I know, I know that you're out there right now. And with it feeling different to you, I have one simple question. Do you want to move into a relationship with Jesus Christ that loved you so much he died for you? You don't have to close your eyes. You don't have to bow your head. But I'm just going to ask you, if that's you right now, could you say this prayer with me? Dear Jesus, I pray for you to become Lord of my life. Forgive me of my sins. And today... I recognize that you loved me so much that even when I was a sinner, you died that I'd become a saint. Our scriptures say that if you confess with your mouth and you believe in your heart, you'll be saved. You just saying that prayer out loud, I believe you believed it in your heart so you confessed with your mouth. I just pray right now for every person out there that has prayed this prayer for the first time. Lord, let us be able to connect with them. Even in the social distancing of six feet, God, I believe that we can be inches from each other's heart at this moment and celebrate with them. I now also pray if there's anyone out there that you have been in a relational rut, if you've had relational enemies right now, and if you can name an enemy, God, I pray for open doors for them to have restitution in that relationship so that they no longer have these wounds that are infected and that are festering and that are becoming scars. But Lord, they can go into this relationship for health and wholeness. And Holy Spirit, you're going to give us the wisdom to do it. You're going to give us the inside of ourselves and to hear their pain behind them. But Lord, the words to speak so that we care more about the real reconciliation versus just being right. I thank you for everyone out there. God, let us be able to find a way to reconcile these relationships. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Amen. Hey, do me a favor. If you, last week alone, 
we had seven people say yes to Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior just watching this broadcast. So if you're out there right now and that was you, depending on what platform, there could be a screen that pops up that says click here. Or if you're on uh, Facebook, make sure just go to Messenger, something like that, and just give us a quick shout out. Let us know that we've made that decision. And go to our About page at the bottom. Let us know that you are here. And I'll remind you again, we'd love to make a donation of $5 in your name to our Charity of the Month just by letting us know that you're catching up with us for the first time. Check out more of the website, more about who we are so that you can connect in a NAV group virtually this week. It's amazing things happening in our online programs now because we're not able to meet in houses doesn't mean we're still not connecting. So I appreciate you stopping by Navigation Church. Be watching all of our information this week as we let you know about the exciting things coming out uh, over the next couple of weeks as we continue to help you take your next step in a growing relationship with Jesus Christ. God bless.